preparing this sermon, uh, I was thinking about my spiritual life. Um, I grew up in the church. I went to a Christian college, went to seminary. <laughs> I'm active here as an elder, leading worship, occasionally preaching. Uh, I have a good marriage, good kids. I tithe. I believe that I have integrity at work. Um, I mean, I haven't embezzled or cheated anyone, so there's that, right? Uh, I think I'm a pretty good guy. How about you all? Good people, right? But how easy is it to rely on our own plans and efforts and just get lulled into complacency, going through the motions? We may even be doing what we think are good things, but we have our own agenda and haven't really asked God for his. Think about our world, our nation. We have a lot of conveniences to make our lives easier, probably easier than any other country in the world. We have Keurig machines to make single cups of coffee, tea, cocoa, options for just about any variety you can imagine. We have cars that think for us, telling us that we are veering too far to the left or right, uh, alerting us that we're about to back into another car, reminding us to put our seatbelts on. It's my favorite. Um, we have a ridiculous, you can ask Andrew about that every time, oh, I put my seatbelt on. Um, anyway, we have a ridiculous amount of options for entertainment. Uh, we have uh, Movies on Demand, DirecTV, UVerse, Roku, Amazon Fire, Alexa, Pandora, Amazon Music, etc., etc. All at the touch of a screen whenever we want it. We have gyms that are open 24 hours, grocery stores that do our shopping for us, and some that even deliver it to us. We have some of the best medical advancements and technology in the world. There are even some professionals who will do phone and video appointments so we don't even have to leave our home. This is all very convenient, and the argument could be made that the benefits include um, being able to spend more time doing the things that we love or spending more time with the people whom we love. But there's also the danger of becoming complacent. We run the risk of taking things for granted, patting ourselves on the back, and really losing sight of what's important. Webster's Dictionary defines complacency as self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. If you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, then you probably realize the temptation of complacency. It can be easy for us to think of ourselves as generally good people who attend church or in a small group, maybe even volunteer some. And yet if we aren't careful, good routines can turn into complacency. Not overt evil, but deficient. What does Jesus think of such a life? Some of you here are still investigating this Jesus stuff. Maybe you're here because you've been self-reliant. It's just not working for you. How can you become Jesus-reliant? Jesus actually talks about complacency. In fact, you might be surprised at the tone he uses toward a pretty good church that had fallen into complacency. Let's read Jesus' letter to a complacent church, learning not only what Jesus thinks, about, uh, thinks but also how we can get out of the complacent, self-reliant lives. Today we're going to start with the book of Revelation in the Bible. Uh, chapter 3 is found in the same section of Revelation that Joel talked about last week. It's a collection of letters to the churches in Asia. They come as part of a prophetic vision that John was receiving from the Lord. The letters were each written to individual churches, but John's choice of words seems to indicate that the message was for a larger audience. The letters contained positive and negative feedback for most of the churches. However, we're going to look at verses 14 to 20 today, and you'll see that Jesus did not have much good to say about the church in Laodicea. Laodicea was located in a fertile uh, valley in southwest Phrygia, which is uh, modern-day Turkey. It was located near where the city of Denizli is now. Phrygia was once a great kingdom. In fact, there's still ruins where Laodicea once stood. And these ruins seem to attest to its once great, once great stature. Its name means the old fortress. Laodicea was at a place where major trade routes converged. Because of this location, it had a place of prominence in the Roman world. 
The fertile land was ideal for sheep grazing, and it was famous for a soft, glassy black wool that was used in making carpets and clothing. It was also known for banking and industry. Additionally, Laodicea housed a medical school known for its um, ear ointment and eye salve made from local Phrygian powder. Um, it, was, uh, it was so wealthy that when a great earthquake hit in AD 60, the Roman senator and historian Tacitus said this, Laodicea arose from the ruins by the strength of her own resources and with no help from us. Can you think about any of the natural disasters that have happened in recent years in the U.S. and imagine those areas not asking the federal government for assistance? That's some serious self-reliance. Remember the definition of complacency we just talked about a minute ago? Self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. The problem is that it seemed to lead in Laodicea, to a sense of self-confidence that was unhealthy. It created a spirit of self-reliance that also led to bland, I-don't-need-anyone's-help Christianity. And what about us? Is it possible that we too have become complacent and comfortable in our faith? How can we get out of that complacent Christianity? Let's look at Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can be rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So understanding the context of scripture, the history, geography, um, culture, can help us get the meaning of, of what it meant to the original audience and then we can apply it to our own lives and our own experiences. So let me give you a bit more information about Laodicea in order to flesh out, flesh this out a little bit more. Laodicea was located between Hierapolis to the north and Colossae to the southeast. Colossae was located near the cool, pure waters of the Lycus River. Hierapolis was known for its hot medicinal water springs. The Romans even engineered a system of pipes to bring water from the hot springs in Hierapolis to Laodicea. However, by the time that water made that trip, it wasn't hot anymore. And it wasn't cold either. Therefore, it wasn't very desirable in the state that it arrived. So there was refreshing cool water to the southeast, healing warm springs to the north. Now I'd like you to imagine a long day at work, pulled in this direction, that direction, working 10, 12 hours, your boss has been irritable all day, Uh, coworkers are negative about your boss and negative about being overworked. You come home frustrated, physically exhausted and worn out. You know what sounds good? A nice lukewarm bath. Or if you're lucky enough, a nice lukewarm hot tub. Wouldn't that just feel healing to your aching muscles? Or how about this? You drive to the gym to work out. You get out of the car because you're in a hurry. You forget your water bottle in the car. You go in, you're on the treadmill, maybe lift some weights, work up a good sweat. And then you go back out to your car and have a nice refreshing drink of lukewarm water. Doesn't that sound refreshing? Mm. Hear Jesus' words again. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. He is looking for a church that will provide healing 
and comfort and refreshing, refreshment to a broken world. The world is coming with broken relationships, loss of loved ones, financial stress, emotional pain. When they encounter small groups here, what, what do they get? Do they find refreshment, acceptance, healing? When they come on Sunday morning, what are they getting? Are we leading them to the source of healing, redemption, nourishment? Jesus is looking for people to engage in an intimate, passionate relationship with him who can then pour out to the world. Are we actually engaging with him? He's saying to the church that the church is not beneficial in the way that hot water is beneficial for cleansing, warming, healing, or sterilizing. He's also saying that they're not useful in the way that cold water is useful for cooling and refreshing. The lukewarmness relates to the fact that they are so focused on themselves and what they've accomplished that they aren't useful to him or anyone else in their current state. They aren't providing refreshment for the spiritually weary nor healing for the spiritually sick. They were totally ineffective and thus distasteful to the Lord. And because they're not useful, Christ is preparing to do what you would do with that mouthful of lukewarm water that you drank after working out. Spit it out of your mouth. He continues in verses 17 and 18. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Christ's words to the Laodiceans were addressing what they saw as their strengths and trying to see how they were actually indicative of what they were lacking and needed from him. As I mentioned earlier, this is a very wealthy or was a very wealthy self-sufficient people. They had accomplished and amassed a great deal. Wealth, wool used for much sought-after clothing, Medical advancements like ISAB. They had a lot to be proud of and celebrate, but it gave them such a sense of self reliance that they no longer saw that they needed anything from anyone, even from God. They did not even realize that this was an issue, lulled into complacency, lukewarm. Let's be clear here he's talking to the church. To believers, when he uses words like wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked, he's talking to the church. All that they had accomplished on their own and all that they had accumulated independent from God had lulled them to a place of not even realizing that it was nothing in the kingdom of God. They were spiritually bankrupt. If Jesus was here today addressing the U.S. church or the Lancaster Vineyard, What do you think he would say? You think that Laodicea sounds a bit like the U.S.? Maybe he would add, you say to me, I have 479 friends on Facebook and 264 followers on Twitter, but you are lonely and you look to vices to get you through difficult times. Look to me for community. Or maybe you say to me, I have worked hard my whole life and have built a solid and secure future for my family. But you never asked me if that was the work I had for you to do or benefited from seeing how I could take care of you. Look to me for provision. Or how about this? You say to me, look at all the wonderful programs that I've run at the Lancaster Vineyard. But you never asked me if those were the programs that my father had in mind for you in the Lancaster Vineyard. Look to me for direction and fulfillment. Let's take a look at Ephesians uh, chapter 3. I don't think that, and I want to be clear, I don't think that any of the things that I just mentioned are inherently wrong. The issue is when we focus on our own self-sufficiency and rely solely on others to try to get the things that God has for us, that's when it becomes a problem. What are we missing out on? 
We are missing out for God's, on God's best for us. Listen to Ephesians 3, starting in uh, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, I've experienced things that went beyond what I imagined. I've experienced the sweetness of his presence during times of worshiping him through music. I've experienced the power of conviction too. It's not quite as fun, but beneficial, right? I've witnessed being getting or I've w- witnessed people getting healed from physical afflictions. I've witnessed the Lord healing people from emotional wounds. I sensed his gentle voice on my spirit tell me last Sunday that he wants all of me just like he gave all of himself on the cross. I've experienced the satisfaction and provision of obedience and giving tithes to the church when finances were tight, and I've experienced him providing for our family. I'm pretty sure that I've only scratched the surface, though. Can anyone here say that they've experienced immeasurably more than they have asked or imagined? If so, I would say that's not the whole story because he's already done that. He met you there and he did that already. So what else is there that he wants to do that you have yet to ask for or imagine? Revelation 3.16 says, I am about to spit you out. This is not judgment. He hasn't spit them out yet, even though he's frustrated with their lukewarmness and complacency. He's telling them that he is on the verge of spitting them out. But look back at verse 19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Church, he is standing at the door and knocking. Laodicea, are you in there? I want to have a meal with you. I want to, I want to have a relationship with you. Lancaster Vineyard, are you there? I want to come in. I have something for you. I want to give it to you. Listen for your name. I love you. I care about you. I want a relationship with you. Let me in, please. Church, he's standing at the door knocking. He doesn't want to spit us out. He wants us to seek him and let him in. He wants to come to this church and into our lives and be involved with us. He wants to do immeasurably more than we have experienced or could ask for or imagine. He wants to come in and eat with us. Eating a meal together in the ancient Near East culture signified acceptance and intimate friendship. He wants to have an intimate friendship with us. He wants us to know that we are accepted. He wants to clothe us with clean new clothes to cover our shame. He wants to give us genuine trustworthy spiritual wealth and let us take part in his kingdom. He wants to heal our eyes so that we can see what he truly has done for us and wants to do for and through us. Uh, I read a short story this week that I wanted to share with you real quick in in, uh, closing. And um, Phil's doing ministry time, I guess, so (laughs) if you want to come up... uh, 
So there were these men fishing at the ocean. While fishing, they weren't fishing for turtles, but they caught this really huge turtle and decided they wanted to keep it. This is a little gruesome, but uh, this is what happens when you keep turtles. They cut its head off and uh, waited for it to die. But several hours later, this thing is still scrambling around, moving around. It, it's just not dying. So there was this older guy that was walking by, and they thought maybe he would have some wisdom on what's going on. So they asked him, what's going on? And he said, he is dead, but he doesn't know it. This is the ultimate complacency, isn't it? Aren't we a bit like that sometimes, though? We go around doing good things, being good people, following our own agendas, desires, good intentions. But are we actually dead and ineffectual and just don't realize any of it? Jesus is standing at the door knocking today. Will you let him in? Will you let him open your eyes to see what you are missing? Will you let him be your provider? Will you let him pour out his riches, the riches of his kingdom? So in, in, preparing, in preparing this message, um, I want to move into uh, ministry time, but it's going to look a little different. Um, and it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable, but... The sense that I had is as I was preparing this sermon, God was speaking to me in my heart about the ways that I have been complacent. And as I was preparing this sermon, it was like he was saying, look, dude, this is for you. And so the sense that I have this morning is that I'm going to go down here in the front and I'm going to confess the things that I need to confess. And I'm going to ask Jesus to come in as I open that door. And I would encourage any of you that feel so inclined to join me. And let's just take care of that business today.